Good morning. Welcome and thank you for joining us for our Northern Light Health Good Health is Good Business Zoom conference. Let's take a moment of quiet reflection to concentrate our thoughts and prayers for the Ukrainian people trying to take care of their families under the most adverse of conditions and for those who are tirelessly fighting for Ukrainian freedom. Thank you. Our panelists today are leaders of Northern Light Health and Maine Health, the two largest private employers in Maine. Both organizations have been at the forefront of addressing the pandemic from day one. We'll explore the pandemic experiences of two clinical leaders and the two CEOs. The challenges are many, the information is constantly changing and the experiences continue. We'll di dissect these leaders' experiences and look for themes and ideas everyone in business can learn from. Today, our topics include the latest on COVID-19, views from the clinical perspective, and views from the top. I'm Dr. Ed Gilkey, Senior Physician Executive at Northern Light Beacon Health. I'll be your moderator for the next hour. Our panelists today are Dr. Jim Jarvis, Director of Clinical Education at Northern Light Eastern Maine Medical Center and Senior Physician Executive of COVID-19 Incident Command at Northern Light Health. Dr. Dora Mills, Chief Health Information Officer at Maine Health. Dr. Andy Muller, President and CEO of Maine Health. Mr. Tim Dentry, President and CEO of Northern Light Health. Before we get started, I will read our legal disclosure. The coronavirus pandemic is an ongoing, continuously evolving situation. Northern Light Health encourages everyone to follow federal and state governmental guidance and mandates. Northern Light Health does not know the particulars of your situation, so the information presented today is general in nature and is based upon Northern Light Health's own experience, which may or may not apply in your specific situation, and which may be revised as we learn more about the coronavirus. Accordingly, following any guidance Northern Light Health presents today in no way guarantees that you, your employees, and or your customers and clients will not contract or spread the coronavirus. A reminder, this hour is for you. If at any time you have a question for our panelists, please use the Q&A function. I'll keep track of your questions and have your speakers respond. Also, I hope each of you take a few minutes immediately following this hour to answer our quick five question survey. Your input directly affects our topics and helps guide our future conferences. Dr. Jarvis will start us off with the latest on COVID-19. Dr. Jarvis? Thank you, Ed. Um, this slide is just a, a, a continuation slide that we've used uh, multiple times during this webinar to kind of show where we are as far as peak cases go. And you can see if we look all the way over to that far right, uh, we've seen a dramatic decrease in the number of cases uh, on average per day here in the state of Maine, which is wonderful and welcome news. But you can also see that that dot is still fairly high compared to the rest of the pandemic. Next slide, please. Additionally, if we take a look at things like hospitalizations, particularly those individuals who are in critical care or needing ventilators, we continue to see a nice downward trend. But once again, I will highlight that that's still, those numbers are still higher than sometimes what we've seen in other parts of the pandemic, but significantly decreased from what we've seen over the last few months. Next slide, please. So recently the CDC um, updated its guidance around masking and masking of course has been something that we've talked about since pretty much the beginning of the pandemic. And there's been changes in what recommendations and, and uh, what to do at what particular period of time. And now with our higher rates of vaccination and our decreasing case counts, the CDC thought that it was prudent to come out with uh, further guidance. I will say that the guidance has been confusing to many including those of us that work in public health um, so we've tried to make it as simple as possible here. The CDC has decided to do things by a county level um, and to declare each county whether they have low, medium, or high uh, rates of transmission. Also, they, they take into account hospitalizations and other factors 
that may indicate that the viral spread in a community is lower than it had been previously. For those that live in counties that have high, that are considered in the high risk for COVID-19, the recommendation is to continue to wear masks while in public. For most of the counties in Maine, that is where we fall. Um, they also think that people should get tested when, when they have symptoms and that added precautions should be used for those who have severe illness. Much of the country now has fallen into the medium category that doesn't really apply to most here in Maine. And for that one, if you are at risk for high and severe um, illness, they recommend talking to your healthcare provider. I will point out that for my own patients who I feel are at high risk for severe disease, I, re I recommend they continue to wear masks while they are in an indoor setting. And then lastly, is that low is the people that are in, live in low county um, community spread. Uh, those individuals are it is no longer recommended that they wear masks, um, but they should get tested if they have symptoms and remain up to date on all of the current literature. So next slide, please. So how do they define each one of these? Really, we talk about that, that the prevalence um, for high is when there is high level of severe disease spread. There's a high potential for the community's health care system to become strained. And in that case, they recommend everyone wear a mask indoors and in schools and addition precautions um, at the low and medium level. Uh, I will point out that some of this data is a little bit confusing and is also interpreted in a way that, that sometimes makes those of us in public health a little bit nervous, particularly when it talks about the potential for a community's healthcare system to be strained. Most of this focuses in on acute COVID uh, disease, which as we just showed uh, in our hospitals has been declining steadily. However, we have seen a significant increase in hospitalizations for other reasons. And therefore, our, uh, our hospital systems are strained already. Um, and we could really ill afford to have yet another surge. Next slide, please. Uh, we also want to update a little bit on treatment options for people who test positive for COVID-19. Those who recently tested positive can do self-referrals and be screened for treatment options that are now open through our Northern Light Health website. For people at high risk for severe illness from COVID-19, early treatments for COVID-19 uh, are highly recommended. And there are several different ones that you can talk over with your provider, or again, use that online screening tool for that to happen. And again, there's the link um, to that particular website is available for everybody on the call. And we'll post that a little bit later. And anyone who's having any particular illness or inner, um, issues with either COVID-19 or any other health concerns is recommended to call their PCP. Next slide, please. And then this is just, again, the same slide that we've been putting on uh, here for, for over a year now, uh, which is really about how people can go ahead and sign up for vaccination if they have not, if they have not yet been vaccinated or if they're eligible for a booster shot and have not, have not done so. The strongest recommendation we can continue to give is that people who are not yet vaccinated get vaccinated. Those who are eligible for booster get booster. We continue to wash our hands. We continue to be careful when we are out in public. And for those who have high, who are at high risk for severe disease, I highly recommend that they continue to mask while in public places. And with that, I think I'll turn it back over to Ed. Well, thanks, Jim. We're gonna next do a poll to get uh, some understanding on what's on your mind as participants. So if you would answer that poll, over the past two years, the healthcare systems in Maine were a reliable source of pandemic information, multiple choice. So let's take a look at the results. Um, over half said always, and over 40% most of the time, sometimes, mostly not, and never. So we're at 92% uh, as a source. Well, that's great to hear. Okay, so Dr. Mills will now join Dr. Jarvis and me on video for our clinical perspective section. Dr. Mills, let's see. <laughs> oh, there you are. Okay, Hi. great. Yeah. Well, thank you for joining us, Dr. Mills. So I'm, I'm going to start off with a, a, a question for both of you. And uh, Jim, I'll ask you to answer first. So to help orient us to the clinical perspective, please give us an overview of what you've been working on during the pandemic. 
And keep in mind, this is total an hour of time. <laughs> I know you both have been working on a lot. Tim? Yeah, so I think both Dora and I work very well together. And, uh, and in fact, we probably send each other a lot of messages just about every week and sometimes more than that. Uh, yesterday, we had a lot of communication between the two of us. Um, so we'll, typically what we've been working on is kind of two different strategies. So one is looking at our own health systems and what it is that we can do within our health systems to take care of the patients that we have already taken care of uh, prior to the pandemic as either part of our primary care or specialty care practices. That of course you know, was, was a big load for us because things are very different during a pandemic than they are at any other time. Um, we, as I already stated, uh, typically here in the state of Maine, uh, our healthcare systems are strained for capacity issues. Um, and so you add on to that a pandemic and an added number of uh, burden, uh, both in terms of patient load and also the resources needed to take care of those patients. That's a lot of coordinated things. But then collectively, the state of Maine did an excellent job working together um, behind the scenes to really coordinate a public health message and a public health strategy. And that continues to this day. In fact, uh, many of the leaders, physician leaders across the state meet on a weekly basis to talk about things like how do we allocate uh, a, a rare resource such as the treatment options that we have um, for COVID-19, which thankfully are actually improving for us and getting, we are getting more resources um, than we have before. Um, things like uh, assisting the state when they have questions about whether we think it's important for us to continue to have a mask, uh, masking in public places or not. And so those are the kind of things that we've really been working on behind the scenes, um, as well as trying to take care of our own staff um, who really have been stressed during this entire time, uh, working exceptionally long hours, taking exceptionally uh, heroic measures to care for patients, um, and then unfortunately seeing an increase in death rates that they had never seen before in their clinical practice. And so those are the kind of things that we focus in on. Well, of course, Dora and I both have our regular jobs to do as well. Um, and so we try to fit that in when we have that spare time in between uh, working on the pandemic issues. And I want to say very similarly to what Jim just said at Maine Health, our, um, our work is really mirrored much of what you um, mentioned, Jim. And you know, our vision at Maine Health is working together so our communities are the healthiest in America. So you know, the pandemic really challenged us with that because we were faced with this uh, you know, once in a hundred years or so pandemic. Um, but we did take that vision very seriously as did Northern Light Health, very similar vision. And um, you know, we start out by you know, taking care of our patients first and foremost um, and taking care of our care team members, knowing that we couldn't take good care of our patients unless we're also taking care of our care team members. Um, and that, you know, meant a lot of things throughout the pandemic. Um, at the beginning, it was, the, you know, a big priority was getting PPE and we partnered, we worked together, right? So we partnered with L.L. Bean and many other uh, main based companies, fortunately, to get in, to make sure we had enough PPE for our care team members to protect them so that they could take care of our patients. Um, and then, of course, as we moved throughout the pandemic, uh, we i uh, got into testing. So I know like Northern Light Health, Maine Health has done a lot of testing. Um, Nordics Labs, our lab, um, just did over a million. Uh, they hit their million test uh, a few days ago, um, meaning that they have conducted over a million COVID-19 PCR tests since uh, in the last two years, which is a little under two years. So pretty amazing. So we uh, got our Nordics Labs uh, really ramped up our testing. And then as of course vaccinations came along, uh, like Northern Light Health, we rolled up vaccinations and uh, we're up to about, we have administered about 600,000 vaccinations to the public. Um, and we didn't, and because we take our vision very seriously, we didn't just vaccinate our patients. And like Northern Light Health, we vaccinated anybody and everybody who needed or wanted it, um, age appropriate or whatever, whatever the criteria was, of course. Um, and then, of course, treatment has come along. Outpatient treatments have come along. So, like Northern Light Health, uh, May, at Maine Health, we are now we have testing centers in each of our uh, service areas, so that people can go in and get quick access to testing and treatment. Um, so there are a number. There are a couple of oral antiviral medications, as well as several intravenous or IM. Uh, shot medications that we want to get to people as soon as they know they're positive, because we know they're most effective when they're um, administered early in the course of a disease. So 
And as I mentioned, we didn't do that alone at all. We did it with not only with our care team, our 22, almost 23,000 care team members, but also greatly in, in collaboration and in partnership with Northern Light Health um, and other health systems and hospitals around the state and uh, retirees uh, who came out of the woodwork to help us vaccinate people. Many, I mean, thousands of volunteers and of course the National Guard and FEMA, um, uh, businesses, many businesses who uh, step forward um, to help us out, help mm -hmm. us through those vaccination days and, and, other, um, and other ways um, to help us volunteer with our efforts. So um, it really truly was a collaboration. And I, and I am very proud of the collaboration we've had with Northern Light Health. Jim and I go back a ways. Um, we worked together on other projects together, but I have to say there were days during the pandemic that he and I were on speed dial with each other. I guess it's not speed dial if it's texting, right? I don't know, <laughs> it's the speed form of texting, but we were texting multiple times a day um, and I was catching him, at, you know, <laughs> times he was with his, at dinner with his family or trying to get dinner with his family. Um, but we were, you know, we were on early morning calls together many, many mornings at 7 a.m., 7.30 a.m., as well as uh, evening text messages about, are you seeing this? And it was just so helpful to have partners at Northern Light Health whom we could really, you know, I could call and just say, we're seeing this, are you seeing that too? Because um, it just gives you some comfort to know if something we're seeing, is it really unusual or is it a new part of the pandemic? Um, and I also want to mention Kathy Knight, um, who heads up end of your public health emergency preparedness and Kathy Bean, who heads up your uh, vaccination efforts in Southern Maine. Um, they've also been on speed dial with me and we've talked and collaborated um, so that we made sure we weren't, Kathy and I were reaching out to the same schools to help you know, offer vaccines to, but we were splitting the list up of vaccine of schools to vaccinate in, in our service area and that kind of thing. So um, the collaborations have been wide and deep with Northern Light Health and I'm truly very grateful for everything that Northern Light Health has, has done and we've helped each other out. So thank you. Great. Well, thanks, Dora. You know, you know, I, I'll just kind of direct this question to you as well, Dora. Um, you, you know, right from the beginning, the messaging was we're in this together. That was at, a, you know, sort of the entire country, perhaps even the world and certainly in the state of Maine. So talk a little bit more about um, integrating with main CDC and and you know I know for a fact uh, the three of us were on the same meetings just this past week with the CDC because treatments are now becoming more available you know we were talking about shortages just two weeks ago uh, they're becoming more available and we're all in the same meetings uh, learning about what's available how to make them uh, available to the patients. So talk a little bit about uh, Maine CDC and how, how it was approached as a whole state a little bit more. Yeah, I think, you know, it's a great question. Um, you know, Maine is, as we know, is not really a state. It's one big, small town. So um, like other smaller states, population-wise, we have one state health public health agency. Um, and I think they did a fabulous job, Nurov. Um, I think it's become a cl close friend of both Jim's and mine. And yeah. uh, he's also been on speed dial and texting uh, all times of day and night with, uh, with I know, with both Jim and me. So, um, and others, other clinical. So Nirav being Dr. Shah. The, oh, the, yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> the, yeah, see, that goes to show you how well you know him, right? Yeah, I know. Mm. Yeah, great. So, um, but yeah, you know, Jim and I, and, and, and I know we've, and you too, Ed, um, we've been in very close contact with the state, uh, Maine CDC, particularly um, with Nurab Shah and, and others there, Isaac Benowitz, the fairly new um, mm -hmm. state epidemiologist and others. And they've been great at um, working with us from the very beginning, really, and mm -hmm. just making sure that they realize, you know, we're all partners in this together. Um, I think years ago when I was actually in Dr. Shah's position for 15 years, and, um, and I used to say, then on the record, very publicly, that our hospitals um, our, are our uh, public health infrastructure for the, uh, across the state for most things, um, including emergencies, uh, many emergencies, uh, public health emergencies particularly. So, um, and I think we've never seen that more as we have the last two years that our hospitals working together with the state and with businesses and many others um, to get 
what needs to be done. And I think now, um, you know, our issues are evolving. And I should just mention, because I meant to mention before that, um, you know, taking care of our care team members, they've been through so much the last two years. And while, you know, the focus two years ago was PPE, um, increasingly the focus with the whole, with all, everybody from the public um, and including our care team members is really our emotional and mental health we're seeing a lot of increases in people suffering um, emotionally and mentally from what they've been through the last two years. And I know our care team members um, across the state and all hospitals and healthcare settings have been through a lot and many in our youth have as well, many have. So I think right now, I know we're also coming together with the state and with each other, Northern Light Health and Maine Health to just make sure that our, the public is cared for in that way as well. Well, it, it, is, it is one big statewide team you know, I think uh, I think folks are fortunate to be part of that. So thank you, Jim. I have a um, a specific question from our audience about uh, a question about COVID. So I'm going to share that with you. Um, might you discuss long-term COVID symptoms, prognosis, and treatments? Just saw something on WGME about increase in mental health issues. Yeah, so we've been you know, talking about, you know, long COVID syndrome or post-acute sequelae of COVID um, for a while now. Um, it was recognized almost very early on in the pandemic as people who were getting sick, um, but then recovered from their acute illness continue to have issues. We continue to see that the biggest issue that people have is, is prolonged fatigue. Almost 50% of individuals who have mild to moderate disease and almost all individuals who have severe disease continue to be plagued with fatigue type symptoms. But when we start talking about mental health, that's a little bit more complex. There's a couple of things that we, that we definitely know are directly attributed to the infection itself. One of them is brain fog or loss of concentration issues. And so people who continue and persistently feel that like they just cannot, cannot focus or may not be able to do their activities of daily living or function at work, they should definitely be reaching out because there may be some things that can be done to help them uh, improve their cognition and get that sense back together again. The other thing that we've been noticing, and this kind of goes back to what Dora said about the fact that we're in communication all the time. Uh, it was brought to my attention by our friends down at Maine Health, particularly Doug Sawyer, their new uh, chief medical officer, uh, that they are seeing an increased number of in individuals who a month or two ago were infected with the Omicron or the Delta variant of uh, coronavirus and are now having cardiac conditions that are not related mm -hmm. to acute COVID, but are probably re related to the fact that they did have that infection. And so I reached out to our cardiology folks here and they said, yes, indeed, they were seeing the exact same thing. Lo and behold, a week later, all of our hospitals saw a dramatic increase in patients who, um, who needed our services for cardiac. And so that's mm -hmm. a little bit concerning because we really weren't focused in on that. We really focused in really on the pulmonary issues that people were having, that fatigue, mm -hmm. um, and then this brain fog. But then let's talk about mental health in particular is that these patients because of these conditions and probably because of external forces are seeing stresses on their mental health, increased rates of depression. And some of that depression is so severe that it's limiting their ability to function in society. And we already had a mental health crisis before this pandemic. This just exacerbated it even more. And I fear that the next six months, we're gonna be talking more about people who had COVID than people who have COVID. Mm. Thanks, Jim. You know, this, this uh, topic actually hits near and dear to my heart. Just this week, um, a friend reached out that her husband um, is suffering from long COVID at this point with lots of what you just described, uh, most notably severe depression to tears. So this is sort of like a manly man up here in Maine and, uh, you know, to tears. That's how bad it is for him. So trying to get uh, some connection to long COVID clinics as, we, as we're developing those now. So thanks for that. I have one more quick question uh, for you, Jim. Uh, this is a question that relates to having reported that care and testing information is available through the internet and signing up for the various things that people need. What about those people that don't have internet uh, access? Any comments about that? Yeah, the best thing they could do is reach out to their primary care provider um, and ask for assistance. I will say that <clears throat> Northern Light, and I know that, that Maine Health has a similar kind of system, is that we try to look at <clears throat> the patients of our own who come back with positive tests and then actually reach out to them proactively to offer them assistance if we think it would be beneficial to them. 
So it really is a kind of that two-way street. But then lastly is putting that piece in there about your primary care provider. And you can reach out to them. And both Northern Light and Maine Health have systems for physicians in particular to be able to go ahead and reach out and get their patients the needed treatment if the patient is unable to get that themselves. And so I encourage that uh, to, to happen. Um, and both of us have, have phone lines that are open. Uh, I know it has been difficult. Um, obviously, the caseloads that we've been seeing, not just in the hospitals, but across our ambulatory practices, have made it difficult for people to have access. Um, this is one of those things where I say persistence is the thing that you need to do um, and get on the phone, uh, make that phone call if you're unable to get through uh, using a website. Mm, thank you. Okay. So this last question is for both of you. Um, and it will wrap up uh, this part of our uh, presentation today. What are some critical lessons learned? And Dora, if you would get us started with that. Oh, goodness. Um, I know, it's, it's long and glorious. It is long. But, you know, I think I go back to what Jim and I were talking about a few minutes ago that, you know, we are in this together because we can't do this alone. I mean, this pandemic is bigger than any one of us any one hospital or health system or government agency or whatever. So, um, and it, it is really been the collaboration that I've been so proud of that we've all, I think we should be proud of as a state um, that we've all been in it together. I remember when we went through the ice storm of 1998, some of you may remember that, and Governor King had the saying, it's neighbors helping neighbors. And I think through this pandemic, it's really been all of us helping each other that's gotten us through. So. Um, whether it's Jim and me or our, our, our employee, uh, employer and uh, business partners such as on this webinar today um, and many others who've helped to just help to increase masking and vaccination uptake and, and make sure that you know, people know what to do. If you get sick, please get tested quickly and because you may be also may be qualified for, um, for medications. We have medications now. So you know, we're moving into a new part of the pandemic, but it doesn't mean um, that we stand alone now. We still, we're in a, maybe a very challenging time in terms of the mental health and emotional health issues that we're seeing. And so, you know, we all need to reach out together and really in, get back to connect with each other, um, with our loved ones that we haven't seen, um, get that connectivity back together. So I think it really is the theme to me, the lesson, the biggest lesson I've learned is how interconnected we really are, whether we've been able to be in person or not, um, and whether we've been masked or not. I mean, it's still, we're still interconnected and it really is that interconnectivity um, that's helped us to get through this last two years. Yeah, you, you know, it, you, you remind me, like we're looking back a little bit, but there's a lot of looking forward to go to, you know, our learning continues from this moment forward and uh, collaboration will serve us well throughout. So thank you. Thank Jim, you. from your perspective, some critical lessons learned. Yeah, if you'd asked me first, I would have said exactly what Dora did. <laughs> she stole your thunder. Been, really been a success. And I think, you know, history is going to be the final teller of what happened. But when they look at the, you know, the particularly our mortality rate here in the state of Maine, a low resource, a low income, a high um, average age state, and we have one of the lowest mortality rates. And I think that really has to do with the fact that we did join together and do the right thing at the right time for the right people. Um, so I'm going to switch then a little bit to say what lessons we should learn from this is really that public health is extremely important and that we need to focus in on preventative care um, and, and aspects of public health that really had been neglected in the past because it's just not a sexy topic. And it's one that we're always not talking about. What do we need to do today? It's what do we need to do tomorrow and beyond? And we need to continue with the great work that we have done in public health here in the state of Maine. Great. Well, thank you both. Um, we're gonna switch over now to a poll and uh, see what else is on our audience's mind. Thank you both. So poll number two, considering the past two years, which best describes your employees? And you have four choices to choose from. All the above, Ed. You notice we didn't give that opportunity. <laughs> so 
So I think the term that came top of mind for 52% was resilient, resourceful. Let's not ignore one third is choosing burned out and hopeful. And like Tim pointed out, uh, really all of the above is pro probably what everybody experienced for sure. So anyway, that will help us uh, guide some of our comments going forward. So for this next section, Mr. Dentry and Dr. Muller will join us on video to offer views from the top. Mr. Dentry, thank you for joining us today and thank you for supporting this Good Health is Good Business webinar series. Today is our 47th session. And Dr. Muller, thank you for accepting our invitation and joining today. So gentlemen, I know we are all going to learn from getting to briefly walk in your shoes. So this first question will be for both of you. And uh, Tim, I'll start off with you. Considering we are speaking with CEOs, let's go to the bottom line. What are some key learning points for you as a leader that you acquired during the pandemic? Yeah, thanks, Ed. And good afternoon, everyone. I, I think, you know, I, I sort of look at it as outward looking answer to that and then more of an inward looking to mm -hmm. the the, the community, the family of Northern Light. The outward looking is that accessible healthcare and equity in healthcare cannot be passive. We do, and and you know, Dora and Jim said it so perfectly in so many uh, wonderful ways. But you know, the the public aspect, the outreach aspect that we've got to make sure is an active part of healthcare. So that's my outward looking conclusion. I would say inward looking is. You know, the people we depend on, our, our colleagues that we work with, are so incredibly resilient and fragile. You know, through all this, I know that I was trying to help with resiliency. And then I awakened to the fact that these are the most resilient people I've ever come across in my entire life. They already have resiliency. And at the same time, they're human. So they're dealing with their own fragility. Yeah, yeah, good lessons. Um, Andy, we'll turn over to you. Um, what are some key learning points you picked up during the pandemic? Yeah, I, you know, I, I have to to agree with with Tim that health equity. Um, it, it just it this brought home just the importance of that, and it brought home the importance of it in terms of our ability to really impact care across an entire population, it really helped highlight some of the disparities that exist today across multiple different axes. And, and frankly, it, for us as a business, um, it highlighted the need for us to be proactive in it if we're gonna survive into the future because uh, we need to make sure patients are getting the right type of care in the right place if we're gonna be effective. And I think the big thing that this sort of validated for all of us in healthcare is, as one of my good colleagues likes to remind us, there are sort of three types of processes. There are basic processes, which is like baking a cake. There are complicated processes, which is like putting a person on the moon. And then there are complex processes, which is like raising a child. And in healthcare for a long time, we have built a very complicated system in a complex world. And we've been fortunate in that the world's been pretty static over the last hundred or so years. The pandemic upended all of that and helped us recognize that we're in a complex world. And for us to survive in a complex world that doesn't require the heroism that we have seen among our care team, then we're gonna have to develop complex systems to be successful. And so I think we've got a lot of work ahead of us to really ensure that no matter what is thrown at us, we're going to be here to help uh, the entire community. Mm, great. Well, well, thanks for that. You know, um, that poll question really was a, a, a real lead in uh, to this next question here. So it's kind of like looking to roll up our sleeves. We always hear in business that our people are our greatest asset. Based on your pandemic experience, please comment on what you learned about the people you work with. And I, I know both of you just touched on that, but you know, let's get down into it and, and see what you really learned. Uh, Andy, you want to take that first? Yeah, happy to. Um, you know, I, I, I believe wholeheartedly, and you know, 
plagiarizing from Southwest Airlines. We're not in the healthcare business. We're in the people business. And we happen to operate mm. an integrated care delivery system. And I think the pandemic has really reiterated that it doesn't matter how good our treatments are. It doesn't matter how good our, our therapies are. It doesn't matter how good, you know, how, how, how much we reduce variation of clinical care delivery. At the end of the day, it's all about our people. It's, it's the people who are delivering the care day in and day out. I think we've learned that um, they, they are incredibly committed to their professions and their communities and really practicing the healing arts. And I think that is true for those who have MDRN, PT after their name. I think it is true for the people who work in our health system and billing and in and in IT and all the administrative functions as well as all of us at some point or another, myself included, we're doing things like participating in, in vaccination clinics or testing clinics or other things. Um, and the flexibility that people exhibit, their willingness to want to participate to make an impact was just absolutely inspiring. So I think inspiring is one of those things. Mm. Um, I think there's no question that many are resilient. And at the same time, they're all hurting right now. And I think one of the hard things that we began to see for the first time ever in healthcare was that real concept of moral hazard, where we've had many, many care team members really frustrated with some of the patients they've had to care for in a way that really challenged their own sensibilities about um, their need to always feel empathetic and, and, and share. And that was true for very mm -hmm. sick patients who, for whatever reason, chose not to get vaccinated to Sometimes patients who just simply weren't kind um, to our care teams. And I think that was really gut-wrenching to watch some of our nurses and physicians and other care team members struggle with trying to reconcile all of that in the moment. Yeah, that, that really is very challenging. Well, thanks for that. Um, Tim, would you comment on what else you learned from people? I, I know you're always immersed in the, the entire staff. Always immersed and always learning and still learning. And I know Andy would agree with that as well. Um, in fact, that's part of the joy of my job is that I have, a, I have the luxury of being able to learn all day long by talking to the staff that I, that I work with. Um, they are our, my greatest source of education, that is for sure. Um, in addition to resiliency and fragility that I talked about previously, I would add patient comes second. And you know what? That's the title of a book. Anybody wants to look that up. Um, and uh, I've probably had that on my shelf for the last couple of decades since it was published. And I kind of didn't. I thought, well, that's nice. But I was raised by a, a mom that was a nurse and, and my granddad was a country doc and patients obviously come first. And so uh, but I reread that a couple of times, especially over the last couple of years. Um, and, you know, it's all about what Andy was just talking about. It's all about making sure that your staff feels that way, that they are first, because if that happens, then the patients are well, well taken care of. Um, so that's just been reiterated for me. And uh, another very brief example of how, I mean, hundreds of our staff, and I know this happened in Maine Health too, worked outside of their job description, <laughs> you know, um, a, a hundred. So the one that just was I was reminded of today was we, of course, have an affiliation agreement with uh, Mass General. And Mary Nagel was here. She's our conduit between Mass General and, and uh, Northern Light Health. And she said, yeah, well, you know, over the last, you know, however many months, I've been, you know, helping to serve trays and things like that, Eastern Maine Medical Center. Well, that's not in her job description to, be, to facilitate uh, our, our learning efforts between Mass General and Northern Light Health, but here's someone who went that extra mile, which happens over, and that's just one story of many. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, Tim, just to take it a step further, you know, you put a lot of energy into making the staff feel valued. You know, maybe share a couple of examples of how, how you've done that. Uh, first of all, wear your heart on your sleeve all the time <laughs> and, um, and connect and listen, be the most, you know, impeccable listener. I, I thought I was a born good listener. No, I've, I've become much better listener. So number one, just let them speak and let them talk about what their experience is. That's, that's one. We have some, you know, different things that we have to encourage that. We have a Friday reflection that, haven't missed one in the, the two years that 
I've been, uh, I've been as the CEO. Um, so that's one example, you know, obviously yeah. town meetings. I know Andy does a ton of those as well. Um, and, you know, so there are a lot of efforts like that. And obviously along the way, we did everything we could to make sure the staff felt that they were going to be safe. You know, I've, I've said this before, we can talk big all we want, but if staff don't feel like they are safe, and that's all, then we are disingenuous and we're going to show that we're absolutely genuine. So pay, paying attention to the feelings and reading it and actually acting on it. Great. You, you know, Andy, I'll give you a chance too to share what you've picked up uh, as examples of uh, appreciating the staff that you found that worked over, uh, you know, the last year. Yeah, sure. Yeah, you know, um, I, I agree with Tim that, that help, helping your care team feel safe in the moment um, has really been a priority. And it's been tough at times. It was tough um, while I wasn't at Maine Health at the time in the early parts of the pandemic, where we just didn't understand the virus and the disease all that well. Yeah. And trying to reassure heroic individuals who are putting themselves and their families potentially in harm's way to provide care was difficult. But we're still struggling with it today with violence in our emergency departments, um, which has really risen to an all time high and something that we're trying to figure out how we can still care for people in a respectful and safe manner, um, while at the same time protecting our care team from that. You know, I think in, the, in a moment like this where the, the, the stakes are high and the challenge is, is, is really hard. And people are really going above and beyond and doing some incredible things. Um, I think our care teams want to be, you know, where they want to be seen. They want to, they, they want leaders to understand what they're going through in the moment. And so one of the things we've really focused on is being visible around it um, and being out and about and seeing our folks. I'm going to, I'm going to borrow an office in, in Farmington today uh, because seeing our team in action, I think is very important to them hearing what they had to say. And then, you know, when you're going through something like this, um, you're not going to get everything right. And we certainly didn't. We got a lot of things right, but we, we, missed, we missed some things. And I think acknowledging that to them openly and honestly, um, and, and I don't think anybody expects you to always get it right, but they hope that you're going to learn, uh, particularly if you're in a leadership role. And so I think um, having the humility to, and vulnerability to, to, to honestly own up to that, um, but then also talk about what you're trying to learn from and how to get better in the future. Well, it really sounds like, uh, you know, doing things that further earns the staff's trust, you know, the employee's trust. You know, that's awesome. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go a little bit deeper into um, the experiences both of you have had in terms of collaborations, integrations, really trying to get a, our arms around how you know, anybody would look at two healthcare systems as being competitors, but, you know, going beyond that for the greater good. So the pandemic is bigger than all of us. We heard we are in this together. Please share your experience with collaboration across the health systems, communities, state of Maine agencies, federal agencies. And then when we're done with that, let's comment on where we think this shared experience is heading. A lot of it is good. I think we've already heard that from, uh, you know, Dora and Jim. Um, we probably don't want to lose it. So where do we see it heading? And uh, since, I, since I see you first, uh, Andy, if you wouldn't mind uh, grabbing onto that. Yeah, absolutely. So for us as an organization, uh, collaboration has to become um, as natural as breathing. And we talk a lot about our vision statement, working together. So our communities are the healthiest in America. We are deeply and passionately committed to that. I am personally deeply and passionately committed to that cause. When I say we talk a lot about it as a leadership team, I was adding up the hours and it's, you know, 25, 30 hours since I've been here less than a year, we've spent an intentional conversation about what exactly does that mean? And one of the key words in that um, vision statement in my mind is together. I think we readily acknowledge that working together so our communities are the healthiest in America is so aspirational. We can't do that alone. <laughs> and so we need Northern Lights to help us on that journey. We need our, our local and state officials and governments to help us on that journey. We need all of you as employers to partner with us to help us on that journey. We, we can't do it alone. And so we, I think, you know, we, we really recognized uh, the value and the team had done that before I got to Maine Health around partnering and collaborating, much in the ways the door talked about earlier, um, vaccination clinics, testing centers, uh, monoclonal antibody distribution. 
all of the ways we tried to figure out how we could coordinate and best distribute um, very precious resources uh, to ensure that our community was getting the most effective therapies at the time and prevention. And, um, and then we need that to continue. I think part of the living in a complex world is recognizing um, that we all impact each other and the importance of that. So I think as we look to the future, um, we've got to need to build those collaborative capabilities um, and, and not necessarily believe that we've got to be right all the time and, and really work together to ultimately create the best outcome. And, you know, I think we have a point of view that the more care we can keep in Maine, the better it is for everyone. And so um, while there may be at times in industries a natural desire to compete, um, competition is not necessarily a good thing for us here. If something were to happen to Northern Lights, that would be devastating to Maine Health. We don't have the capacity to care for all the patients in the state. I think the same is true if something happened to Maine Health, um, then it would put Northern Lights in a difficult scenario. The reason we have, in my mind, not-for-profit, community-based healthcare systems like Maine Health and Northern Lights is to preserve, protect, and enhance the trusting relationships between individual patients and their care team. Um, all healthcare is delivered locally, and it's that trust that is built between people that ultimately can change behaviors, it can impact disease, and result in better healthcare outcomes. And if we're not interested in protecting and preserving that at the local level, then we ought to let a massive for-profit healthcare system come in and run our healthcare organizations. Yeah. But the fact that we're committed to that is why we exist. So we need to partner together to ensure that doesn't happen. So healthcare decisions in the state of Maine can be made by Mainers and people who live here. And so um, that's why I think it's going to be so important in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and I think, I think from the learning, we do have a brighter future because of that. Yeah, thanks. You know, Tim, I'm going to put a little bit of a twist on the same question for you. Um, you know, I, I know um, our teams at Northern Light has, has worked really closely through the governor's office. The CDC was already mentioned, but we also have, you know, some support from National Guard as well as uh, some FEMA uh, groups. You know, talk about how that came together. You know, m most of us don't have any insight into how do you work through the governor's office? How do you work through a, uh, a federal agency like FEMA? So, you know, help us understand that a little bit more. Okay, I, I first though want to start with, uh, you know, your comment of the pandemic is bigger than all of us. Mm -hmm. I would say it might be bigger than each of us alone, but it's not bigger than all of us. So that's number one. A good takeaway. Of, of an old African proverb, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's, we've lived that. And Dora mentioned that, and, I, and uh, Andy Andy described it as well, as did Jim touch on it, but that is absolutely it. I, first of all, you have to have that mindset, and Andy touched on it, that, you know, we, we are here to, to provide the absolute best care we can for the citizens of Maine, period. So let's make that happen. And uh, we both, have, we've shared as we've gotten to know each other, you know, prior experience in other states where we call it, you know, like silly competition, <laughs> like, like you're trying to uh, succeed as a health system at the expense of another health system. That's mm -hmm. ridiculous. We're so happy, both of us professionally and, and personally, you know, that we can be in, in a, a state in an environment where that is not, that's not going to help. That, that's not even part of what we are made up to do. So then as we connect with uh, government officials and others, um, you know, I got, I got my first phone call from Gene Lambrew, who's just the most outstanding uh, commissioner of DHHS. Before I even started as CEO, I had my first phone call from her, and we've been on a regular basis ever since. And uh, so I'm, I'm sure, Andy, same thing. You hit the ground running. And so they all made it so easy. So I observed what was happening elsewhere, and it was seamless when we had a need or, you know, when we just needed awareness or communication or express our frustration of, you know, something that, that needed to be, uh, to be provided. But at the same time, you know, you just touched on a couple of things. I would, uh, that would be, yeah, the Department of Defense, let's not forget all the CARES Act funds and everything else, because this has brought economic 
devastation as well as clinical devastation. Right. So that has been unbelievable. Uh, but National Guard and, and Department of Defense staff, um, I just said to the commissioner yesterday, I said, you know what, I, I will admit I was a little skeptical at first. I just thought we have such, you know, a, a huge crisis on our hands. Is that going to make a difference? It made a difference. Mm. It made a difference in morale. It made a difference when we needed it the most, when we had our highest. Now we can look back and say it was an apex so far, as Jim showed. Uh, but we needed that staff. We needed that extra help. And it, it just eased a lot of uh, stress on a lot, a lot of people. Uh, but communities, I, I would add this to our list of where we've had incredible collaboration, you know, eight mass vaccination sites around the state that we created, at least a dozen testing sites. And then, and then we shifted to therapeutics. And so we're doing as much as we can to help out with uh, administration of therapeutics as those advances have come into play. So, um, and all the things, Andy and I are lucky because we have such incredible staff that we can turn to, whether it's our advocacy folks that are the, uh, holding discussions and advocating our issues with elected officials and others. You just saw, you know, Dora and Jim and the partnership there, that is so natural. And that has happened in our communications and um, our behavioral health, our behavioral health folks are, are working together to try to, you know, learn best practices and see how we can provide care across the state in a really good way. So, so many great ways on those lines. And who would have ever thought that these two CEOs would be on this call. Just something like that, as simple as that, I think uh, hopefully is a good expression to those that are, are attending today um, that we, we mean business. Yeah, excellent, excellent. So my learning point for today is the pandemic is not bigger than all of us. I love it, thanks. Um, Andy, I have a clarifying question from our audience here. Uh, what were the three P's that Dr. Mueller mentioned? Three P's. I don't know that I know the three P's. Tim, was that were, were those your P's? Not sure I Talk caught about that, them. Ed. Oh, oh, okay, okay. I, I'm just reading it directly off the uh, thing. I, and no, if, I, if I had remembered it, I would have actually answered on your behalf. But. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, yeah, we'll Sorry. put that on the side. No, that's okay. That's okay. So, so here's here's a question, and uh, you know, we have to be a little bit sensitive that we're getting towards our wrap up. I mean, obviously, we'd love to do this a lot longer, but um, this is one of my favorite questions. One of the responsibilities for CEOs is organizational culture. Please comment on what impact the pandemic has had on fostering culture in your organization. So I'll give you a chance to take a deep breath on that. Andy, that smile says you're ready. <laughs> yeah, you know, I think for Maine Health, um, we're a relatively young healthcare system and we were, you know, individual healthcare systems that came together to form a large one. And we are still on that journey of becoming one organization. And there's no question that the pandemic um, really accelerated that process. I think mm. we, we had to get really good at understanding how we could best utilize the resources we have to provide the greatest good for the communities we serve. And so it forced us to have conversations about how we share patients, about how we move within our system, how we create uh, standard protocols and procedures at times. And uh, it really did a lot of that work for us in a very, very abbreviated fashion. Excellent, excellent. Tim, you wanna grab on to you know, fostering culture at Northern Light? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have nothing but positive thoughts and feelings about uh, fostering culture in the organization through this pandemic. It brought us all closer, number one. Um, number two and three is we call it, we use the word culture a lot. And we have a culture of yes that we use a lot. And that's what we did a lot with DHHS when we said, oh, you want to get the vaccine out into the arms? We're, we're going to do it. And then we figured out how to do it. Mm. Um, we didn't put the economics first. We didn't have to have perfection of a system before we started. We just said, yes, we will do it. And we got going. So a culture of yes and a culture of caring that starts with caring for one another. And we're, and that is a culture of caring that I believe is um, the, the communities that we serve are, are feeling that quite a bit as well. Mm. Well, thanks. So, um, 
Tim, while you're still on, what are you most proud of? Yeah, well, uh, my colleagues, um, all 12,000 plus. Um, and, you know, I, I say this to them a lot, and I really, really, I, it, it applies to everyone that's listening. I know it applies to everyone going through this pandemic, but especially to caregivers and the, the Northern Light family that at some point at the end of our careers, way past, we, you know, when we hang up our cleats, if I can use that term, um, and in the twilight of our, of our lives, we all will look back on this time. This time will be very vivid in our, in our minds. And I really think we all look back and say, that was the most, ener most painful, but most energizing time when I felt like I was really giving back. And I did. Mm. Tim, you remind me of uh, how I reflect on my internship. It was the greatest year I never want to repeat. <laughs> so, so Andy, if you could grab onto that, what are you most proud of? Yeah, uh, without, without a question, our care team and just the spirit, resiliency, the inspiring stories, the heroism they all demonstrated to get us, all of us, through what we've been through, um, for sure. And I'll tell you, I'm grateful to be here in the state of Maine. I'm so grateful for partners like Tim and Northern Lights, and, um, and that gives us great optimism for the future. Excellent, excellent. Well, well, this this last question is a very personal question to both of you. Andy, we'll start with you. How did the pandemic experience so far change you as a leader? Yeah, if I if I didn't have humility before, I sure as heck do now. If I had some before, I got a lot more uh, now than I did before, for sure. Um, it just it really humbles cool. me. Um, well, without question. Oh, awesome. Well, thank you for that. Tim, what's changed you as a leader? Yeah, well, first, you know, these last two years have been a really tough decade. That's for sure, because that's what it's felt like. Um, and you know what? It, it's real interesting. Just before um, uh, I was offered the position as CEO, so I've been here for three years before that as chief operating officer, and, I was, and the pandemic, pandemic was just heating up. And so I was really thinking through, I wasn't sure if I would get this position or not. And I watched on the Sunday morning show, Bobby Flay. For those who don't know, Bobby Flay owns, I don't know, a dozen restaurants, has written a dozen books and pretty famous uh, chef, et cetera, has a big business in New York City around this. And the Sunday morning show was him in his kitchen doing stuff, you know, and he was, I don't know if they had Zoom yet, but so I guess they were doing whatever the precursor of Zoom was. Um, but as they were talking to him, they were like, what's this like for you as a leader, et cetera? He said, well, you know what? I listen and I learn from my staff and they expect me to lead. Mm. So I think if there's one thing that I've changed as a leader is that definitely emphasize humility, as Andy said, definitely emphasize real careful listening, deliberate listening and the like, and then be decisive, move once and for all what needs to be changed. That's one of our uh, leadership council topics occasionally is it'll be once and for all, what is it that we're, we absolutely have to change? Because last thoughts are, you know, our corporate good, you know, you started with bottom line. I don't think in terms of financials, bottom line, but bottom line, our corporate good is the common good. Awesome. Well, thank you, Tim. Well, I'll ask Dr. Mills and Dr. Jarvis to join us as we go into our closing remarks here. We've included some tools for you at the end of this presentation. Thank you all for joining us and thank you to our clinical leaders and CEOs. I hope this hour of shared learning has been a help to support you as you lead your employees through the many changing phases of the pandemic. Just a reminder, we will be emailing you a survey right after our conference. Please be sure to give us your feedback so we can provide relevant information going forward. Our next session, which will be another session not to be missed, will be on March 17th. Our discussion will tap into the experiences of the presidents of several companies. For our audience, this will be a chance to ask operational questions. A COVID-19 update will be provided at the beginning of this session. 
I realize I am again promoting the next session in our series with exuberance. That's because there's so much to be looking forward to. We hope you join us. We will send you the link for this session. We encourage you to share the invitation with your friends and colleagues. By working together to promote good health, we will be promoting good business. Thank you and have a good afternoon.